what I want to talk about uh, <coughs> today uh, is about Europe, uh, what makes Europe tick at the moment, and how Europe, in my view, uh, is succeeding uh, in emerging uh, from the long winter uh, of its uh, banking crisis. So now what I want to talk about today are two big sets of choices uh, that Europe faces now in the post-crisis uh, period. And these choices are essentially about the political and economic society uh, Europe wants to be uh, and to become. Uh, my argument for you today will be that the consequences uh, of those choices matter obviously for Europe, but they also matter for China. Uh, if, as we all seem to agree, uh, uh, the 21st century is to be, a, uh, is to be an Asian uh, uh, century, uh, nonetheless, uh, that century will be shaped by European choices as well. The Eurozone merges the markets, the currencies, uh, and the monetary policy of 17 out of the 28 EU members who are otherwise technically independent and sovereign states. So you're creating a monetary union amongst a group of countries which remain sovereign states. And that is the core of the tensions and the design and difficulties uh, that have emerged in the operation of the Eurozone. Because Greece's debts are Greece's. Um, if Spain's banking system fails, uh, the problem is Madrid's. But of course these countries, at the same time, share a currency union. So the market, international markets, debt markets, they see Greece's weakness or Spain's problems as a problem for the currency union as a whole. And although the Eurozone has the fiscal resources to manage these problems, whether they be in Greece or Spain, it has insufficient political agreement on how to do so and how to distribute those resources and deploy them to cope with difficulties and weaknesses and vulnerabilities of different states across the Eurozone. So far, they do not have that machinery and the basis for that political agreement. And that's exactly what political-driven form of the Eurozone now requires to be put in place. In a sense, or in other words, uh, the Eurozone has a, um, a political money distribution problem. So Europe's first set of choices is about how to fix this, how to create that framework machinery, that political money distribution uh, system that enables the Eurozone as a whole to mobilize the resources that undoubtedly has at its disposal to make sure that fires are put out in different parts of the forest. Uh, European national identities remain very strong uh, and stronger European states like Germany still have doubts about taking on fiscal responsibility uh, for some of their weaker European uh, peers, especially when Germany feels these countries have brought their problems on themselves by not doing their homework properly uh, and by making mistakes that in Germany's view uh, were avoidable and should not have been uh, taken on. Now, with time, I believe this political what we would really call it, tension, resistance, uh, complexity, uh, I think it will be overcome. But it will take persuasion. It will take justification. Politicians are going to have to go out and not simply tell their public what needs to be done and how, 
but why it needs to be done as well. Something which I'm afraid European politicians have rather lost the habit uh, of doing when it comes to European uh, construction. But the further integration we need does confront Europeans with a fundamental choice. Uh, and uh, that is how European are we? I mean, leave aside the British for one moment, which is one of particularly difficult case in the point. I'll come to that in a moment. But I mean, as Spaniards, as Germans, as Greeks, as Belgians, I mean, how European are we, as well as you know, continuing to adhere to our national identities and our national uh, political uh, institutions. We have national allegiances, but at the same time we are being asked to uh, be European citizens and to sort of support a European uh, 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 construction. Now, what are Europe's second uh, set of choices? In my view, these concern the um, social and economic model of Europe and its future competitiveness, its future ability to make its way and earn its living in a much tougher and more competitive world than we've seen ever uh, before. And one of the things I've sometimes heard Chinese policymakers say over the last five years is that Europe's problems are the result of a European social and economic welfare model that is basically wasteful, extravagant, uh, a welfare model in Europe that somehow sapped uh, our economic uh, competitiveness. Uh, we are, it is said, by many in China, in Europe, living beyond our means. Now, there is a bit of right uh, in this contention. But there's also, in my view, a lot of wrong. The wrong first. I believe that Europe's social welfare uh, states have underpinned, not undermined, they have underpinned the most profound economic transformation that we've seen of anywhere in the world in the 20th century, and that took place in Europe. China's booming growth may be the fastest economic transformation that we've seen, uh, but the European model of market capitalism uh, and strong systems of social welfare provision have created societies that are not only very rich, uh, but comparatively equal as well, certainly in comparison both to China and the United States. So the second of Europe's choices, it seems to me, is how we use this crisis. Not waste it, but use it. Uh, and the opportunity of the next few years to undertake the necessary structural and labor market uh, reform in a way that strengthens rather than undermines our basic European social uh, uh, model. Now, I describe these European choices, and I want to say this in conclusion, as if they are being made in isolation from the rest of the world. But patently, Europe's choices are not being made in isolation. We are constantly influenced, uh, affected, buffeted by what's happening in the rest uh, of the world, in particular in, particular, in, in Asia. So I think that it's important um, to realize that the Asian century is not just about Asian choices. We cannot understand why the 20th century was the American uh, century without understanding the choices that Europe and China, for that matter, made during the course of the 20th century that ultimately led the United States uh, able and powerful enough to define and shape so much of the geopolitical reality of the last hundred years. If Europe and China had acted and behaved differently, notably, for example, if Europe had not chosen to go to war with each other and spark the Second World War, 
What a difference that would have made to the 20th century and to America's ability uh, to shape uh, what occurred. So what happens in different parts of the world influence uh, every, uh, everyone else.